On this Debaco University video, if you're looking at irrigating plants with pond water, this video should be of interest to you because we're going to go over some of the specifics you should be considering if you're going to be using pond water. So let's go over utilizing pond water for outdoor cannabis production. Well, first off, your goal should be, with really any water, is to test the base water. What's the natural water? What are you starting with? No matter the source, you need to have an idea of what the base water source um, has as a starting point. Basics such as parts per million or EC and pH, and also the temperature should uh, be easily determined with a quality water meter. And this is just important to know what you're starting with. The specifics of the pond water also include analysis for microbial life within the water. That's more specific to your pond water. You want to know what type of algae might be living in there, what type of microbial life, what kind of microbial pressure you might have with the water you're intending to use for irrigation. Now, pond water itself uh, li uh, likely contains sediment as well as microbes. So that sediment is could be just from runoff, could be because of heavy rainfall infiltrating into the area. Both of these items, the sediment and the microbes, should be removed before entering the irrigation system. The sediment should be removed because it can clog vital components and the microbes can grow inside the irrigation lines or potentially damage the crop itself. So these are important things to kind of go through and remove and there's filters for each of these. Growers should be implementing these filters to remove these from the irrigation water, um, so it's okay if they're in the original water, but they should not be in the water that is actually reaching the plants. Now there are some filtration options. This is looking at some here for the sediment. So sediment filters remove the visible uh, particulate matter and many particles of dirt, sand, dust, and debris uh, that can be caught by its micron rated capacity. And again, the smaller the microns, the smaller the filter, the smaller particles it will be removing. Sediment filters also remove the turbidity from the water so it can make it have a cleaner appearance. However, the limitations of sediment filters are that they do not remove chemicals, heavy metals, bacteria, or any dissolved particulate matter, so keep that in mind. They also do not improve the taste or smell of the water. They're only like a physical screen is a way to think about it. Now there are different types of sediment filters. We could see here, there's depleted filters located right here, and it's best suited for large particulate. They're also washable and reusable. It's an advantage. Then there's melt blown filters, and they're best suited for finer particulate. And there's string wound filters, look at right below me here. Uh, and once overloaded, the sediment will pass through them, indicating there's a need for a filter change. But this could cause issues down the line. So some growers will kind of run one filter to remove some of the uh, larger particulate, and then another stage filter to remove some finer particulate. String wound filters, great while they're working, but once they get full, sediment will pass through them. Then we see here there's bag filters, and they can change in micron size between 1 and 200. And we have spun down filters are designed to remove large size debris from the water. So you can see you don't need to use all of these, but a lot of growers are choosing to use multiple stages of filters to ensure they're removing all of the particulate. Now, how frequently should you change a filter? Well, this depends on kind of many factors. One reliable method is to watch for a pressure drop, meaning a full filter, this filter was full, uh, meaning clogged with sediment, will cause a reduced in water pressure. So the general recommendation is to change the filter or at least check it every six to 12 months, but installing pressure uh, kind of uh, gauges before and after the filter can see if there's a mass, they should be both reading the same, but if one starts reading very differently, that can be an indication that the filter might be getting clogged or filled with sediment. Now we also within our uh, ponds, we also want to be considerate of the microbes that might be present within the water. And to remove those, a UV light um, can be used. UV light is an electromagnetic radiation with the wavelength of 180 nanometers to 400 nanometers and is damaging to living organisms. Microbes such as bacteria, diatoms, floating algae, parasitic protozoa, and others will be killed from exposure to a UV pond filter. Uh, dead algae cells clump together and then are trapped in the filter, which reduces the turbidity and also improves the water clarity. And we can see that here with uh, fish tank filters, UV fish tank filters. Now, uh, they do work in the same way, but a UV pond filter typically can handle a little bit more capacity. So just keep in mind, it's the same concept, but a little different setting. Now, there's two types of these UV pond filters, UV clarifiers and UV sterilizers. UV clarifiers will have the light intensity, will have um, the kind of lighter intensity than a sterilizer, removing only bacteria and algae. 
The sterilizers require water to flow much slower through them to ensure more um, thorough exposure, removing parasitic pr protozoa, which need a longer exposure time from the UV light to be killed. So if you're getting a clarifier, typically they're more higher flow, they're less intensity, they're kind of like, kind of like cleaning the water. Sterilizing the water, to some extent, uh, requires more intense light and slower flow. So typically um, you're looking at the degree of what you may have uh, to be cleaning out. Sterilizers would be preferred if your system can allow that to be utilized. Then we have the cost of the UV filters. So the low investment is about two, three hundred dollars, with a yearly cost of about sixty. High investments could be over eight hundred, with one hundred and fifty plus yearly cost. There's installation cost to consider, unit cost, electricity, the bulb itself uh, that should be changed, also based on manufacturer's recommendations cost. So these average costs do not account for any extra maintenance that might occur if the UV pond filter is jammed or in poor condition. So again, this is just here to provide you with a general estimate, general uh, kind of uh, idea of what the cost may be if you're considering this type of filtration method. And then lastly, talking about that filter, or that you should say that UV bulb itself, it's recommended that those bulbs are replaced 60 days before the stated expiration date. They're kind of similar to grow lights, just because a UV bulb produces light doesn't mean that it's definitely necessarily a productive light or as productive as it once was at doing its job. If the bulbs are weak, they can lead to bacteria outbreaks or basically not perform the um, necessarily job that you expect them to perform. Depending on the amount of naturally intended uh, microbes and macroorganisms, there are different levels of toxicity with these pond inhabitants, so that can also play into uh, the amount of time you're running the filter, the amount of time the bulb is on, the amount of water you're pushing through it. All these factors come into consideration, but hopefully this provides you just a general overview to get you by some of those uh, initial steps. So if you're choosing to implement this, you can implement it in an effective way.